Rie Matsumoto can't keep getting away with this. I keep giving her anime of the year on these bump of chicken projects while desperately waiting for her to sit in the director's chair on a movie or a TV show, and it feels like it's never going to happen. Almost two years ago, we metaphorically sat here and talked about the best anime of 2018, Rie's latte chocolate ad with bump of chicken Shinsekai. And between now and then, Rie's new anime production total is... nothing. So when my favorite living anime director busts out a new project with my favorite J-Rock group, and it's in collaboration with the video game franchise that defined my childhood, yeah, of course it's anime of the year. Kakushigoto, Great Pretender, Origairu Season 3, and Haikyuu Season 4 can take a back seat, it's already over. And honestly, I'd feel pretty comfortable ending the video right here just by linking you to it so that you can appreciate it and bask in its greatness, but I'm not really gonna pass up an opportunity to talk about it either. So in this video, I'd like to talk about what exactly makes Gacha so good from a visual perspective in terms of its direction, and talk about why Rie Matsumoto's style of storytelling gives all of her works incredibly high replay value. Huh, I think that's the first time I've used the channel name to refer to its actual dictionary meaning. A lot of the points I made in the Latte Ad video are applicable here thanks to the similar structure. In fact, you could chart these two projects side by side and they're nearly identical in terms of the beats. Two high-paced sections that are highly referential to the brand, flanked on both sides by slower sections that expound on the quote-unquote storyline, that storyline being about two people finding each other over a shared relation to the brand, love of chocolate, and their respective Pokemon partners. And a lot of people will point to certain aspects of Rie Matsumoto's directorial choices between the hyper-focus on eyes, the screens coming to life and looking over the real world, the prismatic rainbow confetti ripped straight from Kyosogiga's ending. It all screams Rie, and that's even without jumping into her Kekai Sensen proclivities. Just watch Beyond's ED and tell me there's not a trend here. The main thing I would like to highlight about her style here is the absolute focus on the affinity of Continuum of Movement, which is something that we should credit to the storyboards. Continuum of movement is the transition of the audience's visual attention between shots, so you can think of it like where the audience's eyes should be on screen before and after a cut happens. Affinity of continuum of movement is when the point of attention is similar or the same between cuts. You're already looking there, so you can follow what's happening easier. Contrast of continuum of movement is the opposite. It'll take a moment for the audience to locate the new attention point, which isn't a problem in long takes. For instance, the first two shots in this project, which are a pretty clear reference to Stand By Me, the movie that's on the television in the original Gen 1 titles, are about 10 and 6 seconds in length respectively, and there is plenty of time for your eyes to examine all of the details of the shots because of that. Other parts of the animation do not have that luxury. In some of these incredibly quick sequences, a character might be on screen for all of 16 frames. There are some tricks that this project uses when transitioning from those slow-paced sequences to the fast ones. The main things that help to grab attention from a physiological perspective are human faces, bright light, and movement. The cut from the second shot where theoretically you could be looking anywhere gets an assist by a large human face that is brighter than anything else on screen. From there you'll see Pikachu on the cut, but your eyes should move to the boy again because he's brighter and familiar. And from there on, we're on the right side of the screen where the boy and Pikachu are always the most luminescent things. At that point, it's more or less the same pattern with the girl, except Pikachu's movement has us on the left side at the start. The reason why this matters even early on is because so much of this storyline's emotional weight is predicated on our knowledge that these characters have had their Pokemon partners in their lives since their earliest days, and to share one major physical trait, headresting and kissing respectively. Flipping the script entirely, we have the Shadow Legendaries shot, which is a great example of contrast of continuum of movement. There's a huge wipe over the screen, and the following instance is blurred, as though the camera is attempting to regain focus. Your eyes can really go anywhere here. There's nothing calling out for your attention, and the opening bits of this moment are intentionally hard to follow, with the swirling shadows, the small main characters, and the jumps in the rotation. If you're like me on your first watch, you'll notice Raikou and Entei and the Gen 1 Legendary Birds. But anywhere your attention is, is well spent, because there's something there to pick up on, and the same is true when the antagonists show up. That contrast of continuum of movement, the lack of clear signposting the attention point, is a strength of this shot because it makes that first recognition somewhat random. And because you were almost certainly unable to pick up on the first few shapes, that latter realization is a fun click moment, where the viewer suddenly understands what's happening. I'd love to go beat by beat through this whole project, but I feel like that'd take too long, and I'm going to be hitting most of them throughout this discussion anyway. But the major affinity of continuum of movement sequence I want to talk about 
is this one. We're brought to the center by the protags running across the screen and then a pinpoint of light. Your eye, for the entirety of the following sequence, never has to leave that small area because everything is naturally flowing into or out of that circle. There are movements your eye will make outside of the circle. You'll likely go up to Diantha's eye because that should draw your attention. You'll probably follow Wallace's leg kick up, which is cleverly followed by Cynthia's descent. But the point is that you're never leaving that center for too long. You might track Hugh here, for example, but come the next shot, you'll be brought back to the center thanks to Barry and Lucas. And even if you stick on them, the trio of Trevor, Shauna, and Tierno are all there to catch you and redirect your focus back inwards. Shauna has the most movement in this shot, after all. The same idea can also be found in the second high pace section where we see the sword and shield cast cycle through. And some of those characters are only around for 13 frames. They take up opposite sides, but they'll always touch that center mark. And even if you track them while they leave, you'll meet the new character back in the center because that's the direction they're traveling and spend most of their time there. The last thing I'd like to bring up about the centering is how basing it around faces was perfect for conveying emotions. Silver is on screen for all of 12 frames, and in that time he recognizes Lyra and the viewer and then smiles in the remaining six frames. And yet you'll almost certainly finish that sequence at least subconsciously knowing that it's the post-game Silver who's happy and found meaning in his journey. It's also cool that this is placed after the serious Hilbert, Hilda, and N moment, which empowers the reading that once their journeys are over, they too will find happiness. All right, I didn't mean to start reading into the video. You don't need me telling you that the ending shots fade from sword and shield to stand by me effectively combines both past and present into a look towards the future. Which is all to say that you can see how using human faces and our natural physiology to detect emotional changes also helps to keep our eyes centered even without huge displays like Lily and Celine. Though honestly, I can't help but smile massively whenever I watch that part. And I have watched this thing at least a hundred times, and that is in no small part thanks to how beautiful the animation is, and how easy of a viewing experience it is to follow thanks to that affinity of continuum of movement. But also, because Rie Matsumoto's style of direction when it comes to these kinds of things basically asks to be replayed over and over again so that in regard to those small details, you can catch them all. Ha! If there is one thing that I can generalize about all of Rie Matsumoto's work, it's that they are all super dense in terms of visual information. I mean, just look at this absolute insanity. How is anyone supposed to parse everything in one watch? Well, you're not. Step Up Love is an ED that plays at the end of every episode, and everything on the screen ties into one of the storylines so that when you finally meet the werewolves in the show, you're like, oh! And same with the brain in the jar and literally every other moment in this ED. And slowly, the foreshadowing aspects of these clips start to make sense. Every time you watch through, you pick up on something new and you want to rewatch because there's so much stuff you felt like you missed. In Gotcha, the major causes for me to want to rewatch were the Legendary's Shadows and the Gym Leader Crawl. The Shadow Legendaries we talked a bit about earlier, you're unlikely to pick up the first few that pass by and it's physically impossible to catch all of them, so you'll have a desire to replay it to try and see all of them. But without a doubt, my favorite aspect of the entire production is the Gym Leaders and Elite Four members part. There is so much happening here that I frankly don't even know where to start and that's kind of indicative of what's awesome about it. Like, sure, we could talk about how you're going to follow the female lead at the start because she's aligned on the side where your eyes left off and has the most motion, but your eye will almost certainly wander to the background once she heads off to the left, where you'll either pick up on the trainers by type or maybe catch Evie getting bodied by Infernape and Frostlass. Effectively, there are three visual threads, one based on the main characters, one based on their Pokemon, and one based on the background, and it is impossible to watch all three of those threads simultaneously. Your eye will almost certainly pick up on aspects of all three as it jumps between each, but you cannot get the full visual narrative of all three storylines in one go. Hell, I don't even think it's possible to catch all of the background elements playing at normal speed in one go. But Gotcha makes going back to watch worth it. Jasmine reacting when the male lead gets hit with the trash can lid was such a cute addition. The rock trainers tracking the boulder stoically, the dark type trainers being outside the frame was awesome, they look like ninjas. Crobat running away from its type weakness and psychic, and that's maybe one tenth of all of the fun details. Also, this sequence is so close to be in type weakness order. Water is weak to electricity, which is weak to ground, for example, but it falls apart at fairy, dragon, steel, but it had an incredibly strong streak going. Going through frame by frame and combing out all of the details was a blast. 
trying to find my favorite leaders and legendaries, seeing Celine pop up before she crashes into Lily, Ampharos getting the respect it fucking deserves, the posters for the Isle of Armor and the Crown Tundra in the background, realizing that the hats got flipped at some point during production since they walk away with the opposite ones in hand that they wear in the ending. I just love projects that make me want to stay true to the channel name and replay them over and over again, and Gotcha has that in spades. Some closing thoughts, and I'll keep this brief. I appreciate that this project leaves some stuff up for interpretation. Like, we never see Rayquaza, but who else is going to clear the sky after Kyogre and Groudon? I'm convinced that Rie has an obsession with Ferris wheels, and I would have sworn that the pyramid and that entire setting for the shadow section was a Battle Frontier reference had it actually completed at the top. Honestly, Gotcha reminded me why Pokemon was so important to me, and to some degree still is. And in capturing those iconic moments of fighting Champion Blue and Red at Mount Silver, it almost brought me to tears. Rie, you deserve to sleep after this amazing production on the best anime of 2020, much like your author stand-in does during the credits, but I will not give you the best anime of 2022 to you in two years when this happens again, unless you get a movie or TV series in between then. Unless it's for Zelda or Smash Bros, in which case I'll reconsider. <laughs>